I guess the first place to start is Neil Young. Yeah. When did you fall in love with Neil? You know, my, I have an older sister, Lisa. She's three years older than me. So she was like my music teacher as a kid. When I first started listening to Kiss and Rush and Led Zeppelin, hard rock. But she, she was always one step ahead of me. So then when I was listening to crazy hardcore punk rock, she was really into Neil Young. So as a punk rocker, it wasn't really cool to listen to Neil Young. So I would just kind of wait until she would go to sleep or wait until she would go to school and I'd grab her records and listen to them. And, you know, one of the things that was kind of lacking in a lot of that hardcore punk rock that I was listening to was melody and craft, like songwriting. Not only is Neil a hero today because he's always walked it like he talked it and he's, he has the integrity and the history of like a real legend, you know, he's just, he's amazing. I th people call him the godfather of grunge because he's he's always played uh, what people consider like really like feedbacky, grungy, loud rock. But sort of behind all that is, is a really brilliant songwriter. I love him to death. Plus he's a great dude. We have to talk about Tom Petty if we're talking about people that have kind of carved their own niche. There's no one quite like Tom Petty no. and Damn the Torpedoes especially. Can you remember when that record first kind of came into your life? Yeah. I don't remember how old I was, but I remember I just learned how to give a girl a hickey. And so... Which is a love bite for those of you. That a love know. bite. Yeah. Is that what you call them yeah, over here? What yeah. What were we talking about? Oh, Tom Petty. <laughs> Tom Petty. So, um, you know, Tom Petty is like now an icon and he represents a real... A, a generation of American kids, you know? You, you hear the birds in his music and you hear the Beatles in his music and those first influences that, that made for that next generation of rock and roll. As like an American kid, like you, he was the guy that we all looked up to and you wanna be like Tom, cause Tom's cool too. Like he's never lost his cool. He's just like a scrappy kid. He was that kid who, you know, chewed tobacco and, and stole beers from the convenience store and then played rock and roll and took over the world, you know? Rick Springfield is someone who's very closely connected to the story of the studio. Yeah, Rick Springfield, for years, no one would sign him. So someone told him about this studio out in the valley, Sound City, where they were signing artists to production deals. And if you scored a hit, then you would like split it 50-50 with Sound City. And he was really the first one to pay off. He had a bunch of songs, and there was the house engineer producer, this guy Keith Olson. Keith heard his demo of Jesse's Girl and thought, okay, let's record this. And um, and it just became such a massively huge hit. And if you listen to that record, the Working Class Dog record, like if a band were to re-record it today, note for note, it would still be like it'd be a huge record. Mm. It'd be enormously huge. Those songs are so fun and high energy and melodic and awesome. It's an awesome record. I, honestly, if if the Foo Fighters just re-recorded it <laughs> note for note, people would be like, wow, that's a pretty good Foo Fighters record, you know? Her in his arms, 